Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with Devina Stanley. Devina, welcome to the show. Hi, Will. Good to see you. Devina, you have just published uh, such a nice book, Elevate, How to Lift the Quality of Thinking in Your Team's Board Papers Without Rewriting Them Yourself. So I'd love to spend some time today talking about that book as well as about your practice. But before we dive into the book, why don't you give us a quick overview of your practice, your background? Terrific. Thanks, Will. So I typically help mid to senior level executives get to the point. And having spent some time at McKinsey and coached um, McKinsey consultants for 15 or in fact more than that, perhaps 18 years, um, I've become quite fond of the Minto Pyramid Principle. And so I've taken that as the core of the work that I do and have thoroughly enjoyed helping people all across the world, actually, to, to engage senior leaders and boards. And there's a combination of two things that happen there. One is really understanding the stakeholder environment, which I think as consultants can be a really challenging thing to do because we come in from the outside. So I have some specific things that I work with people on there. And then once we understand that environment and we understand what it is that somebody broadly needs to convey, then we work out how to structure the message. So I bring, I guess, my public relations and communications background together with the McKinsey consulting experience and my original background as a kindergarten teacher. So I bring all of those together to help people. And I just think I'm the luckiest person around. I've got a, a fabulous job. It's so interesting. And I get to work with such wonderful people. So I, I really enjoy it very much. Now, does your work with leaders tend to be very much specific, deliverable based? Hey, I have an upcoming, you know, all hands presentation and I need some help. Or do you tend to be kind of on retainer where the CEO will tap you anytime they have some presentation just to get some quick coaching on it what, how is it normally structured it's, it's somewhere in between those things actually um i think it's really important when learning these techniques and practicing them to work on your own material not to necessarily spend a lot of time on case studies because you you've got to learn the case and there's a whole lot of learning that comes with that that's not necessarily core to the outcome so I work sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in small groups, often in mid to large size groups. And I think the biggest group I've ever done anything for was 700 people, but that's no way normal. Normally, I would say I work with groups of 15 to 25. Um, the more senior people are, though, the smaller the groups tend to get. And the more applied, I find it, it tends to become. So when working with a CEO or a senior executives, I find I, I give them some homework to do and then get together and say, right, who's got something? And we do it together. We work through the process together so they can practice. And those sorts of people are just so very time poor. It's an effective way to practice and learn at the same time um, as delivering something. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll help someone specifically on a particular deliverable but it tends to be more often in the context of learning and, okay. and building so it's, skills. And, and, sorry, go. So, so you're helping just kind of build someone's skills. It's not so much, hey, I have a board presentation coming up. Help me prepare my materials for that. Um, but it'd be more just in general, like working on their uh, overall communication skills. Mm -hmm. Look, it can be. It can be. Help me get through for this particular presentation but oh, more okay. often I find it's about the skill building piece yeah oh. mostly mm. and how do you do you have a kind of a structured existing program that people would go through mm -hmm. is it like a classroom setting or is it you know what I want to tell us about that program that you run people through Okay, so firstly, I understand or and spend some time understanding the environment and what people are particularly looking for, and then tailor the way in which we deliver it to their budget as well, because budgets can vary enormously, and their ambitions also, you know, how far do people want to go? Do they want a few quick ideas, or do they want to really get very good at something? You need to have a very different design for your program depending on their ambitions and also according to the skills that they have when they come to you. So 
when people have a very technical background, and I do work with quite a lot of people who have very deep technical backgrounds, engineers and product managers and so on in technology companies, for example, um, then we might want to spend a bit more time because there's a big gap between um, being able to work with very technical material and then translating what that technical material means to a commercial context. And often those people need quite a bit of help actually to make that leap, to be able to go from summarizing a whole lot of information to synthesizing it, to tie together um, the, the, you know, the, mean, the, the data and the context, if you like, that's, that's quite a big leap. So it depends who I'm working with. So if it is a, a group of people who want just a few good ideas and want to get going quickly with something, then I might offer perhaps a three hour workshop where we work through the process together and we'll help them think through a small piece of communication of their own, or perhaps in a small group, I break them into small groups online and um, do that as they're bringing their own material to do it, but something fairly modest given the time frame. More typically, I'll work with a group over perhaps about six weeks and I give them some learning in advance. And I do that so that I'm not just repeating the same things again and again and again, so that when we come together, we can really practice and learn and they can ask questions and interact with the material. It also means they get a couple of bites at it, if you like, and that really seems to help the learning and the embedding because it's, there's a big difference between knowing about something and being able to actually do it. And so I want to spend my time with them, helping them actually do it. And that's where the books come in. It's where the online courses come in as well. I give those as preparatory work for people. And then typically I'll have a couple of workshops with them, which would be two hours long. I find um, working online, two hours is plenty. And I, I used to do them for 90 minutes and then I found people wanted longer so they could actually dive into the activities a bit more deeply and really work through and then debrief on, on what they've been doing. So two, a couple of two-hour workshops, and then we'll have a coaching session where I put them into smaller groups and we'll work through the whole process together with something live. Then they'll go away in, in small groups and, and prepare a piece on their own and email. I, I give them email feedback. They'll email me their draft. We'll go to and fro on that for as much as necessary and then come back together for a final workshop where they'll deliver the piece of communication they've been working on. And so that sort of iterative incremental learning journey is proving to be really wonderful. And I actually started going, pushing to go online in about 2017. Mm -hmm. And not just because I didn't want to be in aeroplanes every week, which I was, you know, I was flying most weeks and I thought that um, there would be better ways to do things, but also because I was teaching in an MBA program and just reflecting on the way you learn at school or in an MBA program or some other structured learning environment. You don't come into a room for a day, learn everything and then assume you've got it and move on. And that's, I think, a lot of corporate training was being run like that, you know, maybe a half day or a whole day workshop, which is really fun. It's really energizing to do that. And, you know, you, you can engineer it. So you get the, the round of applause at the end of the day and people love it and they leave on a fist pump and, you know, it's, it's great fun, but I, I don't think it delivers the sort of outcomes that we were looking for in actually getting people to build their skills. And so just gradually over time, I started working towards more of a drip fed or incremental learning model and, it's been really well received. And so before COVID, well before COVID, I was doing perhaps half of my work online and half of it in person. And then COVID came, of course, and everything went online. And so now almost everything is online. I see. And it, yeah. What are the five to 10 key points that you hope people take away from your sessions? I imagine some of them would be, you know, lead with the answer one message per slide, embed the takeaway in the title of the slide. What what are some of the mm. other kind of key takeaways or, or key lessons that you're teaching? Mm -hmm. So I think there's uh, two streams of, of work to do. One is to work out how you collaborate 
to get the the final messaging and the document right and the other one is how to get the actual messaging right itself and the points that you've ref, you know referred to there i think are classic points that come out of consulting aren't they where we say okay one message for the story um or the pyramid as some people call it a really short introduction one single message to tie the whole thing together a small number of supporting points that we organize as either what we call a grouping, Barbara Mitchell calls de um, inductive structure or deductive structure. So yes to all of those. But I think before you even get to that, you've got to be really confident that the message that you're structuring is the right message. And so I think the structure in itself does an awful lot for clarity of message, but we want quality of insight as well. And that's where we've got to go back in time and think, well, who is this for? And what do we want to achieve with it? And that's where the collaboration piece comes in because individual consultants, I think, are typically working with clients. So you can ping pong with a client around understanding that stakeholder environment and getting really ready around, you know, what what are we speaking into here? Not just what is the answer to the problem we're solving, but what message do we need to deliver to create some change of some sort? And so step one, get ready, understand um, the, the environment you're speaking in. Think about your communication strategy. So that would be number one. Number two is iterate around that message as a one pager. Some people might be familiar in doing that as a dot dash outline is what we used to call it as Mac at McKinsey, where you have a, an A4 page or letter page, which you have um, a structure laid out in prose format with bullets and so on. Or you might do it in PowerPoint, which is my preferred where you have a very structured outline um, to follow simply because it's really easy to wander off the quality and the structure of the message if you if you use the prose version. So ready, get ready to understand the communication strategy. Iterate around that one page to nail it with your stakeholders before. Then what you do is, is settle the document and creating the document should be really easy. You know, we often think that's really, really difficult, but that's only because the message isn't clear yet. So once you're clear on that message, settle the document and then deliver it. And finally, embed. Think about, well, embed your learnings. Think about, well, what went really well there from a process standpoint, but also from a delivery standpoint. And, you know, did we get the outcome we want? So I tend to think of it as rise, ready, iterate, settle, embed. So they'd be my four things. To think about let's talk about this book elevate um now listeners can't see this but i will just describe it's beautifully designed and i'd like to talk about that a little bit the um is just you know just the the table of contents here it just it's the visual impact is really really nice um and uh yeah, so i'll just kind of read quickly the table of contents of people the chapters so Part one, lay strong foundations. So think differently about your communication, iterate fast and early around the top line messaging. And then part two is lifting out the detail, ready the team, iterate the message using structured thinking principles, settle the document so it maintains the integrity, embed the learning to create a positive flywheel effect. And part three, elevate the team. So we have lay strong foundations, lift out the detail, elevate the team. Um, Walk us, give us an orient us to what is the overall kind of purpose of this document? Who who is it speaking to? This book, and uh, tell you know, walk us through the uh, core ideas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is for leaders, and you could be a leader of a team of three people. You could be leader of a business with thousands. It doesn't matter which. But the idea is that you've got people who work with you who need to prepare communication that engages senior people, and. What I find is that I can go into an organization and help and I can build skills, which is great. But if the leadership's not engaged and involved, then it becomes quite challenging because leaders can, you know, affect the quality of the messaging because they don't understand the principles. But also if, if somebody like me comes in to help, I'm only there for a short time. The leaders actually need to drive what's going on. So this book helps a leader come at this by, first of all, building their own foundations, understanding why this really matters and think learning the, their own sort of approach to building clear communication, quality communication. So firstly, lay foundations to understand why it really matters. 
And then the second one, lift, lift your own skills, because it's really hard to lead this if you don't have a modicum of capacity yourself. So I, I go through um, my way of thinking about this there in an attempt to be really clear and easy to follow as well. And then what we do is at the end, we say, okay, now that you've got a handle on this, how are you going to lift your team's skills? And I offer a range of ways of doing that. It could be that as a leader, you want to coach your people on live work. You know, you, you don't want to do some big program. You just want to coach them as you go. That's fine. Here's how you can do that. You might like to run a, a club, maybe a book club. And I've got a companion book to this one, which is also almost published called Engage which goes more deeply into the structuring piece and gives 10 case studies on how to um, clarify and communicate your message and, and examples of doing that. In fact, it gives 12, but they're based around 10 patterns. And so, um, you know, I give that deeper thing that um, people might have and then, you know, help the leader run a, a, a clarity club, I call it, to help the people just work through that together and really build the skills. Then it's a moderately structured way of doing it to help your people just keep track and actually build their skills fairly independently. Equally, you know, somebody might like to run some workshops. I know a lot of ex-consultants run their own workshops. And so I've got a, a program that people can take to do that. And also, um, if they choose, they can grab my own slides and exercises and so on for a fee to um, build that up. So there's a number of different ways a leader might like to build their team skills. And I try and provide them with a really simple scaffold regard, you know, according to the, the way in which they'd like to help their people. What are some of the specific skills that you're hoping people will take out of this, particularly around kind of this part three, elevate the team? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's, it's about embedding that operating rhythm. So that everyone has a very simple um, habit of preparing that one pager and iterating around the one pager. So I think that's the focal point of the whole thing. Work together in a really structured and disciplined way. Bring forward the thinking so that the leaders and the team can be very clear about the purpose and the audience for a piece of communication. Very often, People spend a lot of time trying to work out, well, why do we need to do this? You, you know, you're asked to do an update or something. Okay, so, you know, can you update the board on your project? Oh, sure, no problem. And then you think, okay, well, so do I just tell them what I've done? Do I tell them why we're we doing what we're we doing? Do I tell them we're up to stage three and we've got some real challenges for stage four? Why do they need to know this right now? And the leader can provide a lot of that information which short circuits a lot of that thinking very early on. So I encourage some habits around that, bring forward that thinking so that the team's ready before they start to think about their messaging, then iterate around the messaging and then the document and the embedding just flows naturally from that. So I think the two key things really are about making sure that the team's ready to prepare the communication and then you iterate around that high-level messaging because so many leaders tell me they take paper after paper after paper home at night and at weekends it sort of goes a bit like this you know you ask for paper and somebody says okay fine all right I'll go do that update that you've asked for and then you send it off to your leader for review and you send the whole thing you send a prose document you send you know a powerpoint deck maybe it's five pages maybe it's 50 who, who knows it's, it's somewhere in that range and then the leader took, takes a quick look at it and says, right, okay, this is going to take a long time for me to really get into this. I'm sure there's all the, the material I need. It's it's all going to be here, but I can't get into it very quickly. So, all right, I'm going to park it and I'm going to come back when I've got a block of time where I can really focus. And I want to do it justice and do the team's work justice. So I need time. And what happens, of course, is that time gets away from them. And so then at nine o'clock at night, maybe, you know, the day before it needs to be delivered or hopefully not that badly, but certainly a while after they've received it, they have a look at it and they think, oh, goodness, you know, I have what do I do? It's too late to delegate it back because they've missed the point completely. And, okay, so can I just ask them some questions? Well, not at 10 o'clock at night because that's rude. So no, I can't do that. So, all right, I've just got to redo it myself. So the leaders end up rewriting the communication themselves. And it doesn't matter what format it is. It can be, a, you know, an email that requires thinking. It could be a paper. It could be a PowerPoint. 
and they end up doing their team's job for them. And while the leader should, does and should have really valuable contribution to make, if they bring that forward and start thinking earlier about it rather than just flicking it off, which is really quick and easy to do as well. So it requires the leader to bring their their own contribution earlier. By doing that, you save a heck of a lot of time. The team sends you a one-pager to review. You can review it in 15 minutes. You then maybe have substantial changes, maybe have minor changes, whatever's necessary, and you can flick it back quite quickly. So you're not holding them up. You're not becoming this massive bottleneck who then, because they're a bottleneck, ends up doing the team's work for them. So it changes that operating rhythm and frees everybody up to work at level. And also everyone then gets to have a much more valuable contribution to make rather than, you know, getting stuck in this sort of track changes form of Um, help. (laughs) Now, I want to ask you a little bit about the design of this document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, It says here in the copyright section that the project Mm -hmm. management and text design is by Publish Central. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tell us about who they are and how you work mm-hmm. with them, and just the mm-hmm. your listeners, the um, you know, like the the, the the headings here are just like nicely called out and different, you know, font size and color, and then there's these nice divider sections between uh, sections, like in a full, uh, that are like this sort of grayish dark blue with with light font, so it's just very clear and and very nicely designed. It feels very very high production value. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that process of just creating creating the, the, the design of this document. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's the second time I've worked with Publish Central and Michael Hanrahan runs it and he is he's a lovely publisher to work with. So he's a self-publishing house and um, I really wanted to do something visually appealing partly because when I way back when when I did study teaching, I studied art as well. And so the design of it was really important to me, partly just from an aesthetic point of view, but also because I wanted to reflect the principles that I'm teaching in the way the book was laid out. So uh, you, you've called out the headings of the sections and so on, which you know I think I attempted to make those very clear and design it in a way that you can see the hierarchy of the messaging really easily. There's those big dividers for those big sections, the big chunks. And then the the most important things have got bigger font and less important, smaller font and so on. And I think one of the things that's been quite interesting there is that there's a big difference between typesetting a book and designing a book. And I was very clear with Michael from the very beginning that I wanted to design this book. And I've seen a number of other books done this way and I thought, oh, I really want to do that too. And um, it has been, it's been a real collaboration because I think – most books are typeset. So he chose a designer within his team who was more skilled than the average typesetter, if you like. But I've also needed to convey um, a fairly clear vision for what I'm looking for, but also show him what that meant. So in the third section in particular, we get to a place where I'm talking about how the team can, how the leader rather can elevate their team skills. And I'm offering slides and examples, which I use elsewhere in the document, but I didn't want to repeat slide after slide after slide again and again and again, because I don't need to do that. I've already included them in the key sections. And I'm just wanting to have the leader know, okay, right. I need those two there. I need those ones. And, you know, so in that final section, made them quite small, for example, and made them thumbnail types of um, design. And, you know, in the appendix offered again, the full size version and, and so on. So, I tried to make it really user-friendly, lots of white space so somebody can take notes. I don't want it to be so beautiful that they don't feel like they can draw and write on it. I think that's really important to make it your own, to make it a tool. So there, there's deliberately quite a bit of white space and, you know, I'm trying to walk the talk, use it, use the message map method, the pyramid method to structure all of the messaging throughout the book and um, make it really easy as a, as a reference so that someone can use it as a guide. So it's been a really wonderful collaboration, actually. Now, you created, you you laid out a distinction between typesetting it and designing it. Explain mm-hmm. that distinction for us. Mm-hmm. How is mm-hmm. designing it different than typesetting? 
So typesetting is where you would choose the basic elements of a design. You might say you might want whole block colour dividers between chapters. You might want this particular large font for your chapter titles. You, you want a fairly simple format for the book where they can largely pour the text in. And there'll be often, you know, business books have got some images and diagrams spread through as well. So there's a, a small amount of design that goes into that. But mostly it's very simple. It's typically um, black on white or perhaps maybe one colour and then white. So a very limited number of fonts, very uh, simple layout. If you think of a novel, that's typeset. It's, it's very simply laid out. Whereas what I'm doing here is doing something that's perhaps a bit more akin to maybe a white paper that McKinsey might do or um, a PDF document that's, you know, laid out and designed really beautifully. So maybe it's, maybe it's a balance between um, slide design, PowerPoint design and book design. It's perhaps... Mm -hmm a mix of both of those where you've mm. still got those basic book fundamentals in place for the shape of the book. You know, I've got two columns, for example. I don't just have all the text going straight across, which you would yeah. normally do in a PowerPoint, but um, certainly bringing in tons and tons of images here. Yeah. Illustrate concepts and, and make sure that they land for people, not just text, text, text. Is your expectation that most people will be reading this uh, as a print copy or just on their screens? I don't know. I, I imagine a lot of people will. Um, I expect some people will also read on, you know, Kindle or an online version. There's something really lovely about a visceral, the visceral experience of having a book and being able mm. to find things. So the portability of online is very, very useful. But I think, um, so I, I guess I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think physical books are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I hope people do get the physical book as well, you know, as, as to have something on their desk as a reference that's physically there as a reminder to keep doing this rather than lose it in the, the myriad of Kindle or other electronic books. But certainly no, want to make it portable too, Yeah. And I think that you said this is not your first book. Tell us about. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so my, my first book I wrote with a collaborator. So Jared Castles and I worked together for a long time in Australia. And we wrote a book called The So What Strategy, which helps um, somebody build a structured storyline and to use patterns to do that. And it's, a, I think, a really useful book. Um, this one is different, I suppose, because it's targeted at leaders and then engage um, again is a little different because it focuses on senior leaders and boards and more complex stories. So, so what strategy looks at quite simple stories. It's deliberately short, I hope quite readable and introduces the idea of patterns. And I've taken that at an extra level, I suppose, in these books. I've got 10 patterns rather than seven. And just for after, I think it's seven years now since we wrote that one, I've just got a much better handle on, I think, what's needed for senior communication. So, um, you know, develop some patterns that I think are much more compatible with really complex stories that you need for senior leaders and boards. Just returning to your practice, um, how do you typically get introduced to these sorts of training opportunities? Mm -hmm. Is it all word um, of mouth? Are you doing you know, proactive reach out to companies? Like how did these come to you? Good question. So I have, um, I guess I've been doing it for a while, which helps, you know, I started at McKinsey in the mid nineties and mostly in Hong Kong, but then worked for firm learning and then back in Australia for a long time as well. So that's helped me build quite a network. Um, also, you know, I think once you do good work, people have your back. So there's a lot of referral in my business, but I also have public programs and I do promote those. So I have an email list of about 10,000 people that I've built over time and that's where I've been able to start building my practice over here in the States before I moved here too. 
so that I'm not coming to an empty sheet. I still work for my Australian clients as well, but I'm able to sort of serve clients all over the place. So I spent quite a bit of time learning about social media marketing and um, using Instagram and Facebook and um, LinkedIn also to help. And so I offer um, quite a lot of free material to help people get to know me. Mm. And that's helped me win work. But I think very often, well, also search engine optimization. I think I'm very fortunate that I don't know if anyone else has been approved by Barbara Minto to teach the pyramid principle, but I had the opportunity to present to her and be approved by her. Thankfully, that wasn't guaranteed, by the way. But, you know, I, I did, you know, a, a workshop and was recorded back in 2009 as part of a negotiation with her. And she said, you know, she proved me to teach it. So being able to sort of state that I think has been very helpful from an SEO standpoint mm -hmm. because people find me. And... Um, you know, that's not something I really talked about until I guess four or five years ago because I just hadn't really thought about it terribly much. But it's been a very useful, a very useful thing to be able to say. And that that helps enormously as well. How have you built a list of ten thousand email addresses? Where have a those combination. Come from? Yes. Um I had a marketing coach for a couple of years before COVID and uh -huh. He helped me learn some techniques on Facebook and the things that he and I were doing together and he helped me quite a lot to build that initial base. I think it was up to 20,000 at one point and that the techniques that he taught me to use don't work as well as they used to, but that gave me a really strong foundation. Um, and so I've just kept chipping away at building that, you know, people unsubscribe, then new people subscribe. And I'm, not, you know, my practice has been quite busy, so I've let it slip, to be really frank. Um, but I've I've kept away at emailing these people almost every week for a long time. Oh, and really? So, okay. yeah, absolutely. And that that has helped quite a bit. And so I think, you know, you get that initial flurry of people going, oh, that looks interesting. And then they think, oh, no, for whatever reason, I don't want to do that anymore or no, so they, they do unsubscribe and you get a much more concentrated, I hope, higher quality group of people that do follow you. Um, so so you're that's sending just a constant out, experiment. It's a constant experiment. So you're sending out a weekly email. Uh, Most what, weeks, yes. What, mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of content is in there? Or helping people with their communication. And so I try and think of things that have happened during the recent period during my consulting work. And mm -hmm. and I'll come across a challenge that somebody's had. And I'll think, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about that. All right. Okay. I can post that and I can post a solution to it as well. So it'll be something that I, a question that somebody asked me or something that I do in a workshop to help people. And then I think, okay, that's going to help people more broadly. And then I'll give it out. And it's been an interesting journey with that, actually, because I've had public programs, as I've mentioned, and I'm just at the moment redesigning my business model completely. And to work out what you give people who pay you every month versus what you give people for free, you know, that is an ongoing learning journey. That's, that's really quite interesting to navigate that mm. to make it useful for people, but then give those who are paying you money more value. Like, yeah. oh, okay. How do I, how do I do that? That's, that's not easy. So and, that's, that's been quite an ongoing challenge. And just curious, what, what tool do you send? Do you use MailChimp or HubSpot or, or uh, some other convert I, kit? Or? Yeah, I use active campaign again, active going back to my coach from all those years ago. And at the time, there's another one, which, oh, the name was on the tip of my tongue for a minute, which is really complicated. And he said, no, 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 use this one um, because it, it has all of the, it's reasonably heavy duty, but it's pretty easy to use. So it's much more sophisticated than MailChimp, um, I think still, certainly at the time that I chose it. So it's a blend of a CRM and an emailing system. And it has some tools in it which are very powerful. So in my business, we like to automate things as much as we can. And as part of this redesign of this business model, we've been simplifying all of the tools in our back end. And 
I have someone who works with me, Sheena, who's been with me for eight or nine years now. She's wonderful. Um, I have well, I have another girl who's helped me as well, Fatima, for about 10. But Sheena is the one who has helped me design these tools and use things like webhooks and so on to be able to link systems together. And so our online modules now we host in, in Thinkific, which is an online learning platform. And I mentioned I get people to do pre-work, so I like them to complete a series of modules and then, you know, do challenges and quizzes with those and and do that before they come and work with me in person or online. And um, so she's helped do things that mean that people get welcome emails and they get signed up to the online course and they get the correct one. And we will, for example, get people to go through a process where maybe they'll um, do a little survey, which is a bit like a commitment form at the beginning of a program, just so that, hey, people understand this is a multi-step program. You've got to have things locked in your diary. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? Yes, 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 yes. Great. Well, now give us your email address and tell us where you'd like your physical goods to be sent to and click send. And that automatically enrolls them into the system and populates a spreadsheet so Sheena knows where to send the books and the other learning materials that we'll be sending them. And so she's wonderful. She's helped me um, set up those kinds of things, which has been, it's fabulous. It gets, it's kind of, it's a fun distraction, but I'm pleased not to be distracted by all of that myself <laughs> anymore. You know, she does all of that, which is great. Wow. Okay. It's a very sophisticated marketing operation. Devina, for listeners that want to find out more about your practice, where would you point them online? Mm -hmm. So if they come to clarityfirstprogram.com, you'll see all sorts of things there to help you. If you'd like to um, hear some of um, more ideas from me, you, they might like to look at my podcast. They can find that on any of their um, favorite players. It's called Cutting Through. You can also come to the website for that, clarityfirstprogram.com. Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. My apologies, clarityfirstprogram.com slash podcast. Or they might like to try um, my free course, which is clarityfirstprogram.com slash email. It's emails, plural. Amazing. So that's a 10-minute course that people might like to try. And how do they get on your, your weekly email list if they want to you know, subscribe to your thinking? Come to the website, scroll down to the bottom of the page and sign up. All right, fantastic. Devina, thank you so much for joining today. Congrats on the publication of Elevate. And it was great. Thank you. you. Pleasure. Likewise.